Hello folks, what's going on? It's Ed, with the Wrestling for MMA podcast. You know what it's about, wrestling, MMA, together, in podcast form. So yeah, uh, my internet just went out, and I was still uh, working on my Mike Brown article this week for Bloody Elbow, but I guess I have this time now, and I figured, you know, I know enough, let's just, uh, let's just do it. So, yeah, this week's podcast is going to be pretty short, I think. But I'd like to talk about uh, the wrestling game of Mike Brown, Mike Thomas Brown, in MMA, a uh, former WC champion at 145, and uh, American Top Team, one of the head coaches. I don't know if he's the head coach, but he's pretty high up there at this point. So, yeah, let's, let's talk about him a little bit. Uh, Mike Brown's wrestling background isn't really too much to look at. Um, he, you know, wrestled in New England, and New England has this weird system where, uh, you know, states is usually the pinnacle of, of your state's wrestling championship. Um, I believe they have states and they have New England's, and I don't know which comes first, but one of them is better than the other. Uh, for whatever reason, it throws me off just because states is either not the pinnacle or there's like something larger that comes before it. I'm not going to check. The point is that New England wrestling typically is not something that, that uh, makes a splash on the national scene. Um, definitely not in high school at the very least. There are definitely guys who come from New England who end up in college that become good. Uh, shout out to, to some of my friends on Twitter uh, like Dylan Ryan and uh, NH Wrestle Fan. Uh, I think his name is Pelican Head right now. I don't know why. But yeah, those guys, uh, those guys rep New England proudly uh, most of the time. Uh, some guys that I can think of in, in the NCAA are uh, Kevin Jack is from Connecticut. Uh, that's kind of where my mind takes me <laughs> right away, and then I forget, because there's, there's really not too much. Uh, Robert Hamlin, I believe, is from Vermont, which is why they call him the Vermonster. Uh yeah, it's it's rare. It's rare to see guys come out of there. It just doesn't really have a strong wrestling tradition, despite being a big area. Um, so yeah, Mike Brown comes from there, and he wrestled at Norwich, which I believe is a D two or D three, and he pinched a nerve in his neck, like really early on, and had an injury, and he couldn't move his right arm. So I feel like most of uh, his college career was rehabbing that injury, and then uh, yeah, maybe he he started. But he didn't really make an impact, you know, competitively as a wrestler on the team. But he was like a leader and took it very seriously and uh, worked hard. So he's another case of like a late bloomer, someone that uh, didn't really meet their goals in wrestling, that, that wanted to continue to compete afterwards. Um, and he, he came about in the early 2000s. So that was just about when uh, the UFC started to introduce the lightweight division, which is great for him. So guys like Eve Edwards, Mark Hominick, uh, BJ Penn, uh, that that whole crop, Jens Bulver. It was like that second wave of lightweights where uh, all of them were good at everything. There was like five or six guys who were all just really re well-rounded and made everyone else in MMA look awful in comparison. And I bet if you have uh, students of worldwide MMA outside of you know UFC history, I bet they'll know of you know 10, 20 other guys. Uh, around those weight classes in the early 2000s who were making the UFC competition look terrible. I think that's the problem with our collective memory of MMA is that we uh, we think of the level and we're looking at Pride and we're looking at uh, the UFC. And Pride you know, did a similar thing with the Bushido shows, like really showing off the lightweight talent, uh, having some of the best guys in the world there. Uh, but I mean, in the UFC, dissolved their lightweight division. <laughs> they you know took it away for a long time. Um, so, you know, it's it's tough because we, people look back and they look at the level of skill and they're looking at heavier divisions usually, um, Walter Waite being the lowest, and it's just, it doesn't compare. It doesn't compare to what those lightweights were like at the time. Um, I believe, I don't want to spoil it, but I believe Kyle McLaughlin, uh, Pulgas Boxeo, our, our leader of the fight site, is uh, working on something about like the lineal lightweight title. Uh, so please, I, I don't want to give you any idea of when that's coming out because I have no idea but I think it's something he's been working on for a while uh, sorry to spoil that for you Kyle if that was a secret 
Um, but yeah, I think you'll learn a lot there. So if you're like looking back and watching through Mike Brown's old fights, um, you find a lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, I started my rewatch with uh, his fight with Genki Sudo. Uh, I believe it was 2004, something like that. Uh, it, it was an interesting watch. Uh, so what I saw right away from Mike Brown is that he had a very linear approach to how to get to his wrestling situations. And as far as his proficiency as a grappler, he wasn't quite there yet. Um, but what I liked was that he was pressuring behind his jab. His jab wasn't great, but he was throwing it, pressuring straight in behind his jab uh, to get Genki Sudo to the cage. Uh, from what I noticed right away, Mike Brown uh, loves underhooks and he's super, super strong. If you're super strong, you're probably gonna end up being an underhook guy because that's the best position where you can leverage that strength um, in a literal and figurative sense. So he's punching in and he carries his right hand pretty low. Uh, most of the time he's throwing like the straight right once they get there because uh, you know not too many guys were escaping uh, laterally when they were pushed backward, especially not in the early 2000s. So pressuring him behind a jab and a right hand straight could get someone to the fence over time he adapts that and he starts like you know hooking on the on the exits on both sides um and you know turning and you know cutting the cage so things that you don't see from top fighters at heavier divisions now you were seeing from him 2004 2006 2008 you know what i mean you know over 10 years ago so that's great so that's a great uh endorsement of his skill at the time uh, but yeah, against Genki Sudo, he, he got to his underhook, and uh, I believe he uh, he singles off of it or he doubles off of it, I forget. But basically, he's a guy that likes to establish that control position on the cage um, and then work him over a little bit from that underhook position, you know, land some ground and pound. Uh, basically, it's encouraged them to change their stance based on how they defend strikes, which is a really smart idea. Um, it's not aesthetically pleasing, and it's not a quick process, and I, I love to see like something clean where... I'm giving them this certain look with my striking, and then bang, I transition to the wrestling, and they're down right away. Um, I love that, but I also respect the approach of a, a more drawn-out process. Uh, yes, he ended up taking down Genki Sudo. He also got taken down by Genki Sudo uh, with a, a trip from over-under, so it was really beautiful. But yeah, he, uh, he ended up getting top position and uh, spent some time in Sudo's guard and got triangle armbarred, but... You know, at, at the time when you're a wrestler, only a few years into your MMA career, that, that stuff happens. It's the typical prospect loss for a wrestler, um, which on, in my mind, it's better than not being able to get your guy down and losing another way. I'd rather that they be able to get their takedowns and get to the positions they want, and then they can just improve their baseline skill in those positions rather than not being able to do it at all. That was my first look. Not a lot to take away there. Um, and then I watched this fight with Eve Edwards. And that was, I'm woefully unprepared right now, and I can't really look things up because my internet's down. But I think, I'm pretty sure that one was 2006. Yeah, Eve Edwards 2006 in uh, Bodog fight. Some people be excited about that one. It was actually in Russia, which is fun. Uh, but yeah, 2004 to 2006, I noticed some pretty significant differences in his game. Uh, his boxing was significantly less janky. It wasn't not janky, but it was significantly less janky, which is was cool. Uh, in terms of entry tactics, they were pretty similar to how they were before, but just I think the mechanics and the depth of those strategies had improved a lot. Uh, something I noticed him doing a lot that he wasn't doing in the pseudo fight was uh, using his overhand, um, which, you know, if that's wrestler wrestler for MMA 101 is... Uh, changing levels and firing off that overhand one because it's just a punch that makes sense to someone that says i want to hit you really hard um they learn an overhand and they're like yes this is this is the one that can just barrel forward on this um that's probably what draws explosive athletes which wrestlers tend to be uh to the overhand as a weapon but it actually it you know plays into wrestling really well i've talked about this before any strike that involves level changing is a good setup for a takedown entry of some sort because it looks like the level change you would use for a takedown entry and it all depends on what the takedown is about which strike that you should prefer to use um i don't want to give too much away of my own my own secrets but uh for example a swing single a sweep single is is an angled shot it's an angled outside shot that involves pivoting uh so really any striking combination that involves that kind of motion like if you're a uh, standing southpaw 
and you're in an open stance matchup and you're uh, jab hooking with your lead hand, that hooking motion of you turning in and, and pivoting on that front foot, that's very similar to how you would actually pivot and change levels on that swing single. So that, that's an example of a strike that would feed into that takedown entry really well. And then for your double leg, uh, really just rear hand striking tends to set up your double leg, uh, which is good because I think rear hand striking is also something that your opponent's going to take more seriously. So it's the double effect of it looks like a takedown entry and it looks like this punch. And uh, the punch is serious enough that people typically guard against it. They have some sort of reaction to it. So an overhand is nice because it's your heaviest punch, probably, if you're Mike Brown. And uh, it looks like a double leg entry. However, he was in uh, the open stance matchup, which makes it difficult to shoot a double. Um, if you like, were taught doubles in a traditional way, you want to take your penetration step between the legs and you're turning the corner and using your head on that uh, that near side hip. And that near side hip isn't really there if they're uh, standing the opposite way. So you want a closed stance, ma closed stance matchup, which means both of you are the same stance. Um, so if you're both southpaws, basically your, your lead legs are gonna be uh, intersecting if you walk forward enough. Whereas with an open stance, uh, your lead feet are uh, connected, they're touching. Um, and then your bodies are, are open across from each other facing out in the same direction that's open stance versus closed stance all you need to know is same stance versus opposite stances um, that sets that up but with an open stance matchup uh, single legs are a lot more available because the the positioning of the legs um, and plus you know you have the hand fight option there and it's, it's easier to just drop into the shot uh, Zach Makovsky talked about that again uh, with his in his podcast with Ben Cohn on the website I recommend checking that out he talked about basically how his takedown preferences are all about stance that he likes the double from close and he likes the single from from open um so against eve edwards uh mike brown was an open stance so he's overhanding in but what's nice about when he's overhanding in is uh eve edwards had this trigger where he'd be throwing back his rear hand and when he threw his rear hand he was really turning over on his shoulder and his hip and squaring up a little bit which made it a little better for a uh an entry uh but what's extra cool is that mike brown likes to punch into collar ties so basically what happened as Mike Brown's game developed is he got really good at, at mixing in the boxing and the clinch together. Like a very early, you know, more meat and potatoes version of what Peter Jan does. Uh, Jan is really good at uh, when he boxes himself into close quarters. He's coming off the wrists and the collar and overhooks and underhooks and all that stuff. And he's transitioning between these clinch, clinch positions and his combinations. Uh, it's really beautiful. Jorge Masvidal does that as well. So you're seeing this from Mike Brown, and he's throwing the overhand. Instead of just throwing the overhand to throw the overhand and then switching back and forth between that and a double attempt, he uses the overhand as a direct transition into a takedown position. Uh, basically the equivalent of a knee tap, but you're finishing on the head. Uh, so he's coming around over behind the head and, and pulling on the knee at the same time, uh, basically changing levels on the overhand. Um, and you know, it, it's not a super high percentage move, it usually, especially against someone taller than you like that, but it's giving him the collar tie and it's allowing him to, you know, punch his way into the clinch. And, you know, I talked about before his process is to punch into the clinch and get you back against the, uh, the barrier. Cause it's a, a ring in this case, not a cage. Uh, so that ended up being a really good striking entry tactic for him. It's just kind of bombing with his rear hand, uh, into range and, when he wasn't in, in striking range, he was still just jabbing into place. Um, so basically, I was touching on the gloves. And what's nice is that when he sees Edwards covering up, he's not just, you know, shooting on his guard. He's actually coming through with uppercuts because if he's jabbing in like that on your hands and basically is touching that hand from open stance, uh, he can pretty easily hook around that lead hand and get a collar tie on that side and then start holding that down and uppercutting. Uh, it's not so dissimilar from what Daniel Cormier does. It's just a little more intentional. I think it feeds into the other aspects of what he's doing. Uh, trying to draw out a reaction. They don't want to be a sitting duck. They need to do something to stop him. Uh, so I, I really like that about his game against Eve Edwards. Plus just, you know, darting, darting entries on the rear hand that cover a lot of distance. Um, and being a wrestler in the ring rather than the cage is great because if you do get someone against that barrier, uh, basically you as the person moving forward on the outside 
you have more room to maneuver than they do because you can actually stick your arms through the ropes <laughs> and you know snatch up a body lock or if you're shooting a double you can lock your hands on the double and they can't do anything about it it's so unfair it's super unfair i hate the ring uh if, if you're fighting a wrestler that's terrible uh if you've ever seen a uh, kyoji horiguchi against hiramasa uh oki kubo he he gets uh pretty deep on a few doubles that i don't think he would have gotten uh, because he simply because he can lock his hands through the ropes um it's a, it's a big deal uh so if, for anyone who defends the ring you're probably the same people that think wrestlers ruin the sport so just know that the ring enables wrestlers and uh it the refs are just not diligent enough to stop that that behind the ropes action there <laughs> um see so yeah, I, I would say that mike brown's pressure is pretty straightforward uh but, i mean edward's at the time was still pretty advanced considering so he's like moving his head off these entries uh but he's still moving back linearly while he's doing that so brown's following up with his left hook and he's hooking uh low so not only is he hooking to the body his punch mechanics just the way he throws he's coming from the hip which is not technically a good thing but it kind of is for someone that loves underhooks and loves to get into these clinch positions basically if the punch fails you're probably going to end up with at least an overhook, uh, but more likely an underhook because their guard's going to be higher. So Mike Brown is just like slinging these these hammers <laughs> into underhooks, and it's working really well. Uh, otherwise, I think he found some triggers that Edwards like to kick off of those rear hand entries. So that motion of him throwing that rear hand and trying to pull that, that uh, near side leg that entry that I was talking about before, that ended up working out beautifully because he was timing Edwards kicking and taking him down off the punch, which was excellent. So maybe it was something he saw from film, if there was any film of Edwards at the time, but yeah, he did a really good job uh, entering off the kicks and um, taking out the kicks at the same time. Well, I also like Mike, about Mike Brown is that he takes the time to set up these dynamics, basically everything I've been talking about so far gets them thinking about his underhook entry and his upper body entries this whole time and he'll pressure 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 and then when you least expect it he'll be coming at you your back will hit the fence you'll raise your arms up because you'll be like okay i need to you know stop him from digging this underhook and he'll fully change levels drop his knee to the mat and shoot a double and uh, his double form is pretty textbook he's leading with his hips uh dropping the knee between the legs full penetration step other leg up ready to to drive um you know, locking his hands behind him and he's getting enough depth on these shots that he is usually able to lock his hands um and against the ropes that's great against the cage that's great um so he's one of the few wrestlers in mma who still does the full level change just the full uh drop down uh, onto the knee which i really appreciate um but yeah it's nice because he sets it up not only with you know in the moment tactics that make sense for setting up a a double leg because he is giving that threat at the high level so they're bringing their arms up and thinking about a punch but it's also just that he got them thinking about takedown entries uh and you know clinch entries at the higher level as well so as there's dueling uh dueling setups there it's very intelligent and it looks so like uh like uh, my friend tuman tushinov calls it an, an unga fighter like they're a caveman they just like to like hit things with clubs and grunt it kind of looks like that sometimes on the feet for him because he's so strong and his mechanics are a little jank sometimes, but it's really smart stuff. Um, it makes sense. And then when he's in the clinch, uh, here's what I, I love is that it's not just the tactics with him. His baseline skill level in the clinch positions and on the ground, once he does get the takedowns, they, they evolve to be pretty fun. Um, so in the Edwards fight, for example, he hits slide buys which is one of my favorite things to see. It's a move that I definitely don't fully understand the mechanics of. I did a breakdown on a uh, Zarabek Sidakov, uh, two-time world champion at 74 kilograms. He beat Jordan Burroughs, beat Frank Camizo. Uh He's number two pound for pound in the world. He's Russian, obviously. He's great with a slide by. Basically, he pursues this aggressive hand fight and keeps pummeling, pummeling, pummeling with people on the feet and holding good position. And as soon as they tie up in collars, he can reach inside the bicep or you know over the tricep rather basically peel that and fling it the other direction and uh, you know pivot and throw by so it's it's coming off the inside of the the arm which is the funky part about it but you see here uh, i'm looking at it 
Mike Brown is uh, in a single collar tie, pretty close range, and with his left hand, he's on the inside of that bicep, um, and he's got the collar tie with his right hand. And basically, he turns his body to the right and uh, opens the window, like lifts his elbow on that left side, throws it by hard with that inside grip, which is really difficult to do. You have to have, uh, you really got to sling it. To, to get it to work so he throws that by and he's pulling on the collar to make edwards go in that direction uh, but it's beautiful because if you hit it right and you're hitting that pivot at the same time you take their back pretty quickly so that's a nice one for for a uh, a grappler not just a wrestler um so yeah he's hitting these slide buys on e eve edwards and getting to rear standing and he's got a whole other uh game from rear standing yeah he hit two slide buys on e eve edwards um he hit traditional mat returns just you know cinching tight on the waist and uh getting his hips at an angle and popping his hips up and lifting and returning but he's also got some funkier stuff uh from like extended rear standing positions he'll uh, drop into a crab ride which is not my favorite idea just because uh if it fails you're on your butt and they have height over you which isn't good uh, but a crab ride is basically when you have uh inside hooks uh, from the back so you're underneath their legs and your feet are coming out inside their thighs um, it's it's a dangerous ride for sure it's it's fun because it, you can pretty much just get your own hips back pretty quickly but people try to sit back into you and, and get on top of you so in wrestling it's really rough because uh it's all about your fight with like the seatbelt grips and the underhooks and making sure they can't turn in um and if people sit out really hard, there's not much you can do about it if you don't have that grip secure. In uh, MMA or Jiu-Jitsu, it's not as rough of a position just because if they turn around, they're in your guard, which is like, okay, whatever. Um, but in MMA, it's, it's, a, it's a risky move, just, you know, in a close fight, which this was. Um, but yeah, he's dropping down, uh, basically just putting those hooks in behind the legs and, and dropping his weight and hoping that that pulls him down because his, uh, his grip is high enough. Uh, so that, that was a little risky. Uh, he did some other cool stuff in this fight. He, uh, he body locked through the ropes like they were just in a normal underhook situation. And he punches forward and, and gets the, uh, basically has the, the ropes collapse back to give him room to get the body lock. And he drags that down. Um, he also hit a really nice uh, inside trip. And he hit it with the underhook on one side and just kind of pulling the knee on the other side. Um, it was a pretty shallow inside trip, but just the force behind it and the positioning was really nice. Um, he, he had a lot of cool stuff he was doing relatively early days uh, for MMA. And uh, I'm just looking at this rear standing work again. On that uh, rear standing mat return, he does something awesome. Uh, basically, he has rear standing and he has one arm trapped and he hooks one leg inside on the rear side and starts to circle toward his uh weeb leg and drops while he's doing it it's like a an inversion roll almost like you would see in jiu-jitsu but he's doing it from this body lock and dropping down and kicking up and elevating that leg and with that elevator on the inside of the leg he's pushing edwards towards the other side because edwards wants to uh get height and sit in towards him but he's using that elevator to push him the other way so there's a lot of like nice little details that i'm noticing watching him work for some of the other crab ride attempts, he is just dropping straight back and uh, trapping the arm and trying to underhook and trying to get to the seatbelt, um, come up on uh, in turtle position is his goal there. But uh, yeah, it's just really, really cool stuff. Uh, I think his full game is on display most in his uh, rematch with Uriah Faber. In the first fight, Faber can't deal with uh, Brown's pressure boxing and he just gets blasted pretty quickly uh, I think Brown left hook uh, right straights him B Faber hits the fence and as he's hitting the fence Brown is already adjusting and getting ready to uh, to shoot on him and takes him down with a double in the first uh, round I would say Faber gets up and uh, basically off the break of the takedown attempt he's he's beaten on him and Faber stumbles off and uh, tries that elbow from turning away and uh, runs right into a right hook, which was uh, foolish. Yeah, and he gets knocked out. But in the rematch, uh, he has a lot more time to show what he can do to someone like Faber. Uh, 
Faber is always a tough matchup for wrestlers just because he's so hard to hold down. But uh, Mike Brown, I could do a whole article about Mike Brown's grappling in that fight. He does a really good job of uh, like uh, weaving his arm in between the legs and underhooking legs and um, keeping grips behind Faber's head and like cradling him almost, cradling his uh, his collar and pulling him back. Or like when Faber posts to start to sit up, he's just dragging the, uh, the near posting arm out, doing cool stuff like that. Um, my favorite thing that he does to Faber is... Uh, he works from he front headlock so much because Faber basically defaults to rear standing. He defaults to turtle, referee's position, whatever you want to call it. Um, whenever someone's on top of him, his strategy is similar to Derek Lewis. Just going to give up my back and stand up and see what happens. Um, obviously, he's better at it than Derek Lewis. It's just a symptom of heavyweights not being able to control from rear standing or put hooks in for him but uh yeah i mean mike brown had answers for that uh basically every time they're in those re-standing turtle positions uh either either one if he did return him he was switching off pretty quickly to front headlock and what i like about that is one it's a, a better control position for him because he can really bear his weight down and favor can't turn away from him uh because favor didn't really try to like sit out or do anything fancy from front headlock he didn't seem as confident there on bottom Plus, that's where Brown's weight starts to make more of a difference because he's really carrying his weight at this point. Because uh, in those turtle positions, he was really just bearing down parallel. He wasn't really riding a hip or putting hooks in. So he wasn't really feeling his weight quite as much as he did in front headlock. Plus, Mike Brown's grip is insane. Uh, so I like that, and I also like that he's using it uh, to mix up his attack with both guillotines and Peruvian neckties. Um, as well as like the pocket guillotine, like what Pedro Munoz and uh, Jack Hermanson do. So he's coming out of these turtle positions and taking his uh, near, his, his left arm basically, hooking that around the neck and then circling back out to front. But while you do that, you could theoretically use your uh, lead leg on the side you're circling to to trap the arm against the neck while you're doing that, which is kind of how you set up the pocket guillotine. Uh, but you could also just uh, come off from that angle and since you're circling out from that side already on the guillotine, you could get height and uh, sit through for the Peruvian necktie, which he showed a couple times against Faber. Uh, but more often, he was just uh, boxing him up, pressure boxing him, and Faber tried to circle off the cage, but Brown was following him with hooks and cutting the cage. And uh, basically, the dynamic that started to happen was that Brown was boxing into range, Faber was like ducking and trying to underhook himself, and uh, you know, find some ways to get Brown off of him. And when Brown wasn't getting to his own, own underhooks, Favor was just really shelled up. So he was doing what he did to Edwards, where he was collar tying and uh, firing off punches to multiple uh, targets when he was uh, pushing into him. So he was going to the body a lot, which was excellent, switching between the body and the uppercut um, with his right hand and his left hand. So he's just really tagging him no matter what he did. And uh, as far as the entries go, Favor was so happy for the guillotine. Uh, basically all Mike Brown would do is control one leg, lift and return on the takedown because on the return he could angle him off and land in side control and then use that underhooking motion on the leg to keep him from regarding, making the guillotine pretty useless. Um, so yeah, really dominant pressure wrestle boxing performance there from Mike Brown. And I know that Faber broke both his hands in that fight, but he broke both his hands having bad punching form and hitting Mike Brown in the elbows and the head because Mike Brown does use a high guard um to come in behind for his pressure so it's his own fault um but he did very similar stuff that he did to eve edwards there where he was working him so much from the underhooks and upper body against the cage uh and rear standing that eventually Faber started to focus more on those positions and stand more upright and then brown started changing levels fully on the double and uh hitting some some lower attacks he started aiming for the body uh you know from range boxing him up against the cage uh, he really wore favor down that fight. It was a beautiful performance, but that's basically as far as I've gotten with his career rewatch at this point. Um, I think I still need to watch his fight with uh, Leonard Garcia, which only lasts a round, so I can't think there's too much there, and I don't really think much of Garcia as an anti-wrestler, but uh, he has a really nice grappling match with Hani Yaya, so maybe there's some stuff to, to see there, but basically as soon as he fights Aldo... Uh, and loses to Gamburian uh, around 2009-2010. I think that's about when his prime is officially over and he's in decline. Uh, so I, did, I wanted to give him more credit and look at him at his best because, I mean, he was a pro since 2001. 
and already had a pretty serious injury he was recovering from coming into that. Uh, so eight years as a pro by the time he wins the uh, the WC title. Um, but yeah, I, I really respect that he had a process at that point and his game worked together so nicely and his baseline skill set was so great. Um, he saw also somebody that when he ends up on his back was using leg entanglements to get out of these situations and scramble through. Um, he, he was just super competent, a super competent fighter, super strong, uh, obviously cerebral. Uh, I'm hoping that I can get him on here. I, I don't really have any way of getting in touch with him, but I'm working on it. I got a couple leads that, that might work that out, but I'd like to hear him talk about it. And then also if he's passing on any of these ideas uh, to his you know students, you might say the fighters that he trains at American Top Team. Yeah, I said this was going to be a shorter one. It was only about a half hour. Uh, this whole podcast was uh, a response to a Patreon question uh, from one of our patrons, uh, Don Garcia. I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong again. And I'm definitely not going to try to pronounce his handle, but I'll put it in the tweet for this episode and in the YouTube description. Uh, but yeah, this is basically just me saying how much I like Mike Brown and he does cool stuff. And, uh, yeah, I guess around this time I could have been talking about, uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov versus, uh, Tony Ferguson, but that's not happening. Uh, they just announced, like, right before I started recording this, they announced that it's going to be Ferguson Gaethje. Uh, I don't foresee them really getting into any wrestling situations. Maybe if someone's rocked and they start wrestling for some reason. I, I wouldn't really describe either of them as someone who implements like a wrestling for an MMA system. They're more anti-wrestlers, both of them. Uh, I would say Ferguson is actually the more willing wrestler between them just because when he gets into a wrestling situation, he's not just looking to disengage and escape. He's looking you know to hit switches and reverse and uh, do things that are going to end up with him in a dominant position. Not as often, but as you know, actual wrestlers in MMA, but... It's a thing he does, whereas Gaethje, despite his credentials being a lot better, um, is mostly just trying to, uh, like, fat man roll and Granby and, uh, you know, do, do some cheap escapes just to create separation, which usually work because he's pretty athletic and he knows the timing and the feel for the moves. Uh, but, yeah, you have a D1 All-American versus someone who is competing at, like, club nationals and NAIAs. So, um, credential-wise, it, it, they don't really match up. But in terms of how they use their wrestling in MMA and who it's worked against... Um, I would say they're they're about even there just because there's not too much to go off of for either of them in that regard. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I definitely favor Gaethje, even if it's a short camp, just because stylistically uh, he's built to capitalize on some of uh, Ferguson's defensive holes. On the other hand, like the best performance I could see from Ferguson would definitely involve like linear kicking to the body and uh, you know punching straight, which is something that could work on Gaethje theoretically, but it's not like he's going to stand there and get hit. He has good proactive and reactive head movement. Uh, he knows how to get his, his distance, how to weave his way into uh, close quarter boxing range, which is where he beats people up. And plus, I don't really know how well uh, Ferguson's going to deal with being low kicked, um, even without a setup. I think uh, Dos Anjos did very well with that. And uh, I don't believe Ferguson did anything in particular to dissuade him. He just kind of stopped. So I don't see it being a great matchup for Ferguson. Um, but yeah, you know, thing, things happen. But I, I've always kind of seen this one as something that favors Gaethje, um, especially with Ferguson not being chinny, but, you know, just being hittable and getting rocked by Anthony Pettis and looking very vulnerable and there to be hit against Cowboy. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's I, I feel like he's a knockout waiting to happen. Uh, and I, I like Tony Ferguson. I just think uh, it's a bad matchup for him, and he's probably a bit past it. There isn't a ton of evidence to support that, but he just physically appears to be slowing down a bit, and this was never going to be a great matchup for him. So I hope you know that he fights a good fight. I hope he approaches it the way that uh, I think might work, um, which is the same thing I would want him to do to uh, Khabib, which is uh, you know s straight linear pressure with, with round kicking and... Um, Straight, straight kicking, rather. Uh, I think that could work out, but, you know, I, I don't really want them to fight because I don't like the UFC should be holding events right now, but that's none of my business, I guess. Uh, but, yeah, that, that was it. Um, not really anything to talk about in terms of international or folk-style wrestling, which I think I will try to touch on more often. 
you know, just like current events and stuff. But, you know, the Olympics were canceled. Uh, NCAAs were canceled. Uh, Spencer Lee won the Hodge Trophy, which is pretty cool. Spencer Lee's from uh, Western Pennsylvania. Uh, Franklin Regional High School. He's a three-time PA state champ. If you didn't know, Pennsylvania is definitely top three, you know, universally in terms of states that are hard to wrestle in. Um, I think, you know, Ohio, New Jersey, and California would be considered, you know, part of that top four elite echelon. But people usually regard Pennsylvania as the toughest, especially because uh, of their production at the college level. Uh, but yeah, he won three state titles at big, big states. And then he lost in the finals his senior year to Austin DeSanto, uh, who he tech falled the year before that, funny enough. Uh, he had a pretty serious knee injury, but you can't take that much away from DeSanto. He wrestled a great match and clearly made a lot, a lot of improvements. Um, and Austin DeSanto is a, a nut, a nut for sure, a wild man. Uh, you probably saw his clip that went a little bit viral from NCAAs his freshman year, I believe. He, uh, he was losing, losing to Stevan Nicic uh, at NCAAs, and he cartwheeled on him and uh, tried to Kimura him in this transition. And uh, yeah, he cheated, and it's it's tough because he's uh, someone that struggles a little bit with... Um, it's hard to say exactly, but uh, you know, he's someone that doesn't function exactly the same as everyone else, so it's uh, I, I don't feel fair holding things against him. But like yeah, he should be accountable for his actions and not try to hurt people. But by all accounts, he's like actually a good guy, um, just an absolute madman on the mat, which uh, you gotta respect it. But yeah, Spencer Lee lost to him in the finals, and then went to the University of Iowa, uh, won two NCAA titles so far, and this would have been his third, I believe. He was looking good this year, didn't take any losses, um, but he he was awarded the Hodge Trophy uh, posthumously, you might say, uh, after the season was canceled. Um, which is like the Heisman Award for wrestling, if you don't know that. So it's a big deal. Um, Zahid Valencia was probably the front runner for it. And then Zahid was suspended by Arizona State because he tested positive for cocaine uh, overseas in Italy. So apparently that was his like third test that he failed. So that's why. Yeah, so I love Zahid. So hopefully in the future I can talk a little bit more about wrestling just because uh, I got stuff to say. My podcast with Seth, uh, Wrestling Comrades, where we talk about freestyle, kind of, you know, in a in a lurch, <laughs> just because there isn't any freestyle to talk about, and Seth is so busy trying to finish up school, and then he's going to go to grad school, so I don't even know how busy he's going to be, but at least I'll be able to reference some, some things here and uh, hopefully fill that void for you in the meantime. Uh, but yeah, hopefully I can get this out tomorrow, which is Tuesday, and uh the Mike Brown article should be out Thursday, Friday, probably not Saturday. I'm going to aim for Friday at, at the latest, uh, maybe. But yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, please support the fight site on Twitter, on Patreon, read our articles, post our stuff on Reddit. You know, I, I would really like it if you posted our stuff on Reddit. That would be the best way you could help us. Uh, not the viewership directly benefits us just because we don't like run ads or anything like that but i'd be happy <laughs> just to, to get more attention and continue to grow our base because you know we're new we're new it's only been six months or so uh but yeah next time i might have a guest i'm not sure i can't promise that um but i have more patreon questions to answer and uh i've definitely been recruiting some help for a couple of those and uh yeah you might you might see a guest sometime soon uh i hope you guys enjoyed zach last week i love him to bits great guy very insightful uh seems to be a great coach cares a lot and uh he's working on uh some statistical sort of analysis uh for iowa wrestling basically their home arena uh, carver hawkeye arena is famous for being super hostile and hard to wrestle in um and if you like are in a close matchup, but like you fall apart and look uncharacteristically bad and like lose in a certain way, uh, it's called being carvered. And uh, basically, he's doing a study on like how real, how real is that that effect? How real is being carvered? Uh, and he's doing it over like multiple seasons. And, you know, so I don't normally like statistical analysis, but something so straightforward with like points and results, um, you, you could probably do something like that. So I'm looking forward to it. He's a smart guy, so uh, I'm sure it'll be quality. 
And uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's all I have to say for now. Uh, so thank you for tuning in. This is episode three, and I'm looking to keep them weekly, so uh, I'll give you something next week. Even if I don't have my guests, I'll give you something. Uh, maybe maybe reply to this and shoot me some messages about stuff you might want to hear about for next time. Uh, yeah, see you later.